Requesting connection. Established. Encrypted. We're live. The show you've been asking for. Advice, technology, and community. Linux first, all others second. This is Ask Noah. Live from Speed Technologies, the Ask Noah Show starts right now. This is the show where we came to do all the things on Linux they said couldn't be done and take your questions on how to do the same. The phone lines are open this hour to be a part of the program. It is a free call, 1-855-450-NOAH. That's 1-855-450-6624 or send an email to live at asknoahshow.com. My name is Noah Chalaya. I am your host. Delighted to be here with you as another episode of the Ask Noah Show kicks off this hour. Joining me is my co-host, Mr. Steve Ovens. Welcome in, sir. Good evening, Noah. How's the week going? You know what? We made it past the, the last blizzard of the year, and I'm excited to say it's in the 40s and all the snow is now melting off my roof, and so as long as I don't get swept away at a massive flood, I'll be just fine. <laughs> it hit 70 here today. I need to move south. For those of you that don't <laughs> get the joke, Steve is in South Dakota, so it's south by like 300 miles, if that. Let's get into some feedback. Our first email comes in from Chris. Chris writes in and says, Hi guys, love the show, but I'm just curious. There were some audio issues with the recent episode. For some reason, you and Steve sounded like you were out of sorts. As if your voices deepened and you were speaking slowly. Maybe it's just me. But it sounded like the recording version of the podcast played from Google Podcast sounded, hmm, different. So, uh, I'll address that right off the bat. E- e- there, there's this weird problem that happens in Linux audio. So I said this, I think the very first episode of Ask Noah show I ever recorded, I said, there is not a Mac or Windows PC in this studio and there never will be. And to this day, I'm sur- it's grown a lot. There's a lot more Linux PCs in here, but they're all running some flavor of Linux. And one of the problems that I have with Linux is there are two ways I can get audio in and out of a box. One is using the Livewire IP driver that is so kindly put together by Paravel Systems and, and Axia uh, from the Telus Alliance. So, and that works flawlessly 100% of the time. However, they only compile that driver for CentOS Linux and CentOS, I think they're up to a grand old 7 now. So they're up to CentOS 7, or you know, Red Hat Linux 7. And that works 100% of the time, no problems whatsoever. And that's great. But for OBS that does all of the recording, I'm obviously using, I want to use the newer version of OBS, and so I'm using Ubuntu on that box, and they don't have that audio over IP driver. So I'm using a USB audio interface, and under Linux, there's this weird problem where every once in a great while, I think it's happened like three times, we've done, this is episode 331, I have had this happen maybe three times in the entire show that I, the entire time that I've been doing the show, but it will change the sample rate to a different sample rate. Now, after the first time that bit me, I actually purchased a rack mounted Moran's recorder and I have that available to me. But what happened last week was I looked over and I went, oh, shoot, I forgot to hit the recorder. I probably don't need I better do it anyway. And I hit the button, but I hit the button seven minutes into the show. So the first seven minutes have our voices a little deeper, but the rest of the show is just fine. And if you know how to fix that, it's <laughs> it has been bothering me for 331 episodes. So if you have a way to fix it, let me know. But that's just the price I paid to be able to tell you that I do everything on Linux. I always have done it that way. I will always continue to do it that way. So that's the price you pay for using open source sometimes. Uh, so the email continues. Enjoyed the segment on Graffini OS. I'm curious what your experiences have been like with Google Maps and Android Auto. These are the two items I find I cannot live without. I recall Chris Fisher mentioning some issues with these services and wondering if your experience is the same. Sincerely, Chris in Japan. So thanks for reaching out, Chris in Japan. I um, So a couple of things there. As far as uh, Android Auto, I'll just tell you flat out, I don't have a vehicle that has Android Auto, so I'm not the best person to give you feedback there. Here's what I would tell you from a general standpoint. If you don't have Google Play services installed or you have Google Play services installed, but you don't allow them to run in the background, then you're likely going to have issues with things that ordinarily work with Android. If you turn those things on, you install Google Play services and you allow them to run in the background, You have some protection in the way of memory hardening and you get to choose what sensor data those services get access to, but largely you're starting to work your way back into the Google boat, okay? So I have divided my communication into three, we'll call them buckets. The first bucket is the bucket that you're all familiar with, and it is the 
day-to-day driving work I am expected to function in society like a normal adult. And so walking into my boss's office or a client's office or wherever else and going, yeah, I, I would love to be able to do that, but I can't participate in that team's meeting because I use this thing called Graphene OS. Maybe you've heard of it. It's a super secure version of it. I can't do that. Like, I, I have to be able to function in the rest of the world. So I have a phone for that. Currently, that is a Samsung S10 running whatever hacked version of Android that Samsung puts on their phone. I'll get to that in a second. The second one is my personal phone, which I use for being able to talk to my family and keeping in contact with friends and those sorts of things. That is the phone that I've recently moved away from stock Android and really Lineage OS into Graphene OS, and it has wildly blown away my expectations. And the third bucket is my ultra super private. It doesn't really even need to be connected to the internet. I just call it a companion device, and it's where I put my thoughts and notes and schedules and stuff like that, things that don't need to be on the internet and are not on the internet. And so at this point in the journey where I'm at is that that my personal phone, I don't need Google services. I don't want Google services. I don't plan on using Google services. So they are not installed. I installed them long enough to be able to try things like Uber and Lyft and some other things that had been problematic in the past. They all worked fine on Graphene OS. But I have when I when I reflashed the phone and started actually using it as my personal phone, I don't have Google Play services. So I strongly suspect if you're having issues with things like Android Auto, you'd have to install Google Play services and allow it to run in the background. It is not completely in vain because you're going to still have some of those privacy protections. It's just infinitely less because now you have something running on your phone. And oh, by the way, if you've Google Play services, whether you're on stock Android or anything else, drains the battery like crazy. Getting rid of Google Play services has easily doubled or tripled my battery life. So uh, the the second thing that you would need to do in some cases is be able to disable uh, the exploit memory compatibility, or, uh, excuse me, disable memory exploits. And they have a memory hardening system that you can disable. They call it me- exploit memory compatibility mode. And if you turn that on, it will disable the memory hardening so that it gives uh, Android access to typical memory spaces, again, inside of its own little sandbox, but will fix a large amount of issues. So if you're having issues with that, that's what I would do. And Google Maps, I absolutely tested, works just fine, um, but again, requires Google Play services. So what I'm using for navigation on my personal phone, because I don't have Google Play services anymore, uh, I've tried two apps. One is Magic Earth, and the other is Organic Maps. So Organic Maps actually pulls from OpenStreetMaps and works really well. Magic Earth, I'm not sure where their map source is, but both of those apps allow you to download and store the maps locally on the phone. That's of note because the, when I was in, I was recently in uh, Sydney, Australia, I was went to drive around and we kind of did it on an impulse. A friend called me on Friday. He's like, hey, do you want to go to Sydney? I'm sure. So we jump on a plane, we get over to Sydney, and but when we land there, we realize that the North American maps are not downloaded onto my Garmin GPS, which I typically use, and I didn't have cell phone service, so I had no way of navigating around Sydney, and we wanted to go to Canberra and see kangaroos. And so it that it became problematic real quickly. So having the local maps on the phone is something that is really, really, really important to me, and both Magic Earth and Organic Maps allows me to do that thing. A couple of follow-up things that I'll note. So my experiment with Graphene OS on my personal phone has gone so well that I'm starting to venture into, in fact, I actually tried this week, to move my primary work normal person phone over to Graphene, Graphene OS because I believe I'm ready for that. I went to do, I knew I wasn't going to get Graphene OS to work on my Samsung S10, but I bought my Samsung S10 for two reasons. One, it had a headphone jack, and two, it was on the supported devices list for Lineage OS. So I thought I could flash Lineage OS onto my Samsung S10. Here's what I learned this week and why I will never buy a Samsung phone ever again. They made two versions of the Samsung S10. They made one, which is an international version that's sold all over the world, and you can flash whatever you want onto it, unlock the bootloader, install Lineage OS, do everything that you want to do with it because it's your phone and you own it, and it's fine. Then there's the Gat Darn G- 971U version. The U means it's made for the United States. And that special snowflake of a phone was lobbied by the carriers inside of the United States to remove the ability to unlock the bootloader. So there's apparently one human being on planet Earth that has figured out a way to un- to hack his way around this bootloader. But to do so, you have to uh, basically allow him to team viewer into your computer. You plug the phone in and then he does whatever it is he does. And it costs you $75 and he claims that he can unlock the bootloader. So 
A, I'm not sure how I feel about that. B, even if it works, I'm a little concerned as to what did we do to the phone to be able to get the bootloader unlocked. And also in his disclaimer, he, uh, you know, goes through some things like, so you've burned the keys for Samsung Pay, which or Apple Pay or whatever, uh, Google Pay, which uh, admittedly I wouldn't use anyway, but it's just... I'm making permanent changes to my phone and I don't even understand what they are and I'm just sore about the whole thing. So I'm either going to replace my Samsung S10 with uh, contenders are the 6T, which has less RAM, slightly slower processor, a slightly older phone, but it, it has a wired headphone jack and supports Lineage OS or one of the Pixel lines and I could either do Graphene OS or Lineage. And if you have thoughts on those, I'd be interested in hearing from you at live at asknoshow.com. So to recap, haven't tried Android Auto, don't have anything to test it with. I strongly suspect it'll work if you have Google Play services enabled and running in the background. And as far as Maps, Maps absolutely works under Graphene OS if you have Google Play services and enabled, but I wouldn't use it. I would use Magic Earth and Organic Maps. Other questions or other follow-up to my uh, my fun with Graphene OS, write in live at asknoshow.com. Second email comes in and says, hey, no one, Steve, the latest episode has to be one of my favorite of all times. Such good info in there. I also have a Pixel 6a, and after listening to the episode, I flashed my phone with Graphene OS. Installed Google Play services, and from there, their app repo, it is indistinguishable from my Googleified Pixel. I honestly had given up hope that a person could run a privacy-focused phone, but it can be done. Thank you so much for the show. The fact that you guys walk the walk and not just talk the talk is what keeps ANS at the top of my podcast list. So... There's a certain amount of irony in there that that particular episode was bitten by a bug that exists inside of Linux when you're using USB audio in Linux. And <laughs> there's, I find comedy in that. Sounded like you were taking a breath. Nothing? No, I was chuckling. I just was not very loud. <laughs> <laughs> Our third email comes in from Kevin. Kevin writes in and says, hi, guys. Thanks for the show. I'm looking for suggestions for a privacy respecting phone tracking app. It's an oxymoron, I know, but I need to keep track of my elderly relative. Thanks, Kevin. So the go-to tracking app, if you're looking for an open source app that runs on your phone, would be OwnTracks. Self-hosted, doesn't leak data to the cloud, all the rest of it, and you can keep an eye on, on th those sorts of things. If it is a willing participant, uh, that is to say, that, I, that came out wrong. If it's not one of those things where you're like, here, Grandpa, let me set this up for you. There you go. Now your phone is set up so that I know where you are, and then you want to leave it alone, and it's fine. If it's one of those things where you have somebody on the other end that's willing to participate in the process or able to participate in the process, my wife and I use OwnTracks for doing uh, school stuff, but one of the things we've gone to is location sharing in Element. And what's unique about that is they actually encrypt the location data and they run it through a proxy. So one of the problems is even if the encryption data, it's, or excuse me, the location data itself is encrypted, if you're rendering a map inside of the phone, a person could, if they knew what they were doing, go through and figure out what user accessed what portion of a particular map at a given time, at a given date, and they could potentially backtrace it to you. So Matrix does a really clever thing in where they pull that map data, proxy it through their servers, and then deliver it anonymously to your phone. So nobody knows which person pulled which part of the map. They just knows that Matrix sucked up big, massive portions of a map and did something with it. They don't know what. And then, of course, the the location data itself, the coordinates are all end-to-end -end encrypted. So when we do things like we go on trips or something like that, oftentimes you can do it one of two ways. You can send a static location, just say, here's where I'm at, or you can do live location tracking and you can share that in a chat. And so where that's been beneficial to us is oftentimes we'll go on a trip and my wife will say, I'm going out to the store. I'm going to run over here, do that. And so we'll both just enable our beacons so we can see where each other is and where, or if we're going to a shared location, like, hey, we're going to drive from the airport, you know, to the hotel or something like that. And we're in different vehicles. We'll turn that on. So we both know where we are and where we're going to. If you have a third person in the group that's out of place, then you can kind of see here's, you know, here's Noah, here's his wife, here's the person that we're going to, that kind of thing. So all of those might be an option for you. But if you're looking for a dedicated app, own tracks. Steve, I'm guessing, I'm guessing uh, location tracking and location sharing is that's like solely outside of your wheelhouse because that would involve taking the glass brick on your desk and moving it somewhere. Yeah, I was going to say it'd be pretty hard to track my phone. Like my wife, she already knows that if I'm outside the house, she probably is not going to get a hold of me. Mm. So, <laughs> yeah, okay. not likely. Uh, our fourth email comes in from Charlie. Charlie writes in and says, G'day, everyone. I recommend that Steve and others consider replacing Zigbee with Laura. 
Laura can work on 433 megahertz, 915 megahertz. I'd recommend checking out the ESP8266, the NRF24, uh, and the Laura Express LRS. Maybe these videos will give you some help. And then he links to some Laura videos. So, Steve, have you looked into Laura before? And what are your thoughts? Would it work for you? So, I did look into Laura um, previously, and although I didn't become aware of Laura in a serious way until after I had kind of picked um, Zigbee for things. When I reinvestigated after, so I, I watched a couple of the videos that, that Charlie sent in. Thank you, Charlie. I had forgotten how much I liked watching Great Scott's videos. Um, <laughs> so I, I followed him on YouTube for quite a long time. But anyways, um, I came to the conclusion that I probably am unlikely to adopt Loro because uh, they're roughly the same price as Z-Wave. And for me, adopting another technology when Z-Wave has been so solid for me, it doesn't seem to make much sense because I'd have to go out and buy the coordinator or whatever the LoRa equivalent is. And then I would have to also invest in that technology, which is more or less the same price as, as the Z-Wave stuff. On top of the fact that it's a little bit challenging to find all of the sensors for LoRa in a battery format. There's tons of stuff for, for the LoRa stuff um, that runs off of wired um, mm. in some capacity, right? There's tons of boards and stuff like that. But if I was going to, if I had the liberty to run cabling, this would already be a solved problem because I already have, I'd say at least half of my motion sensors in the house are already made up of ESP 8266s um, in some variety or ESP 32s. Mm-hmm. The the things that I have left is just, it's impractical to run a cable to, for example, a door sensor on the front closet door or, you know, the motion sensors in the kitchen, which are on a vaulted ceiling and up mm-hmm. high away from anything. And, you know, the spousal approval factor is basically zero for running cables <laughs> to those places. So what, yeah. if, what if you, what if you hid the wire inside of like a string of Christmas tree lights and you're like, Hey honey, we're going to have little white decorative lights going through the house. Isn't it beautiful? Uh, no. Okay. No, wouldn't work. I, I, she might go for it. I wouldn't. Oh, okay. That'd be way over engineering. I, it, <laughs> the expense of, of adding the lights and then having to deal with the lights in some fashion just to run. You know how many run, watts that'll cost me? Just, well, there is that. Uh, but just to run the, just to run a USB cable, for example, for the ESP8266 stuff, like, mm-hmm. no, that, that's just not, not likely. Seems like you'd run into other problems too. There's there's got to be distance limitations of how far you're going to run USB, and you'd have to use molded cables, which means you're stuck at whatever the maximum length of factory cable. I, I don't know. I, I at the, the, as I'm just thinking about that through my head, I'm coming up with all sorts of pain points of why that wouldn't necessarily be practical. Yeah, it was a tough a tough thing because like then you would also have you'd have to have either the power bricks in the wall or re- start replacing your receptacles with ones that have USB outlets. And then there's there are challenges there as well, not to mention the fact, like I said, um, in various hallways, plugs are not necessarily easily access- mm. accessible. And you, mm-hmm. could, you could get around that if, if you were tolerant of having wires or you're going to run mini conduits everywhere to hide your wires. That's just not likely to be uh, what will happen. Not to mention, whenever I do have some sort of uh, Wi-Fi issue. So the other night, I actually woke up hot because my automation failed, or so I thought. And I ended up finding out that the trunk cable between my PF sense, which manages all my VLANs, and the core switch just jiggled itself loose in the middle of the (laughs) night. And so... The Z-Wave stuff kept working like a champ, but any of the Wi-Fi related stuff broke because it couldn't talk across the the VLANs. And so I've I've had many Wi-Fi meltdowns in the past from things just being attached to the Wi-Fi, but not actually getting any signal and having to go in and manually kick them off. So yeah, Wi-Fi hasn't been great for me either. Every, every automate, this is not an exaggeration. Every automation system that I have at my house is either wired or it is some sort of independent RF thing that then is 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 wired into the network. I don't use Wi-Fi for 
anything in I, really i don't use ip for well that's not true because the wired stuff is ip but yeah so the like the honeywell red link stuff is all it has its own rf thing back to a controller and then the controller is hardwired into the network all of the lutron lights go rf back to a controller and then the controller is hardwired into the network and i've i, I moved into my current house in 2015 i'm doing the math here carrying the one amount of issues Zero. Zero issues ever on any of those systems, in part because there is nothing to fail. They all talk to their own thing, and then they all are hardwired into the network. So I'm, I'm with you on the, on the Wi-Fi thing. It sounds great in principle. It seems like, hey, we got Wi-Fi everywhere. Why wouldn't we tie devices to it? But you're putting all your cookies in a basket, and a basket that's eventually going to fall over. Yeah, especially because even, even in the best of times... Mm. I, you know, I've heard people like, yeah, my Wi-Fi has been up for 300 days. And like, I can't go 40 days without rebooting something mm. around here. Mm -hmm. Even even though I I am knowledgeable in networking. Yes, my certification is super old, like from the mid 2000s. But the you know, the fundamentals of networking haven't changed. So it's not like I have no experience doing networking. I even did it early in my career as a job. Mm -hmm. So there are just times where things just get all uh, crossed, I suppose. What, what's the downside, other than cost, what is the downside of Z-Wave? Why not just rip all of the Z Zigbee stuff out and just say, okay, Z-Wave has worked well for me since day one. I'm just going to I'm gonna go ham on all of it. What's what's the that, downside? I haven't had any Z-Wave failures. Um, That's what I'm saying. Like zero. Right. The... So I had a device, like a single Z-Wave device die, right? But that's the device failure, not like even uh, walking up. It was a light switch and walking up and flicking the light switch did nothing. So like something mm -hmm. in the switch, like just melted down. Um, so yeah, it's, it's purely a cost related thing. I've got 30 odd Zigbee stuff, Zigbee things that, that at an average of $30, depending on what it is, you know, you add that up. And then mm. if I was to replace all of the Wi-Fi devices that I have, I'd be well into 60, 70 devices that I'd have to replace. Okay. But so, okay. So, you know, I mean, like two grand or whatever. But so, but, but yeah. So, but other than cost, there is no, you don't see any downsides to, Z well, okay. So cost and then the licensing, right? So Zigbee is the open protocol. Z-Wave is the... <laughs> less open protocol that is open enough to work with all of the open source things, but not open enough to make all of the Libra people super happy. Yeah. And I suppose the other thing, and this is a, a small thing, but the aesthetics are less, um, there's less variety in the aesthetics of the Z wave stuff. So for example, oh, really? for whatever silly reason, the contact sensors all look like you've taken like a, a a triple A and a double A in terms of length and stuck them together. <laughs> and that's how long the contact sensor is. Why? I have no idea. Like, I don't know why they are formed the way they are. So there's some aesthetics there um, th that the Zigbee stuff, because maybe because there are more, there's more competition there that they just branched out. I have no idea. So I didn't install this. Okay. I just came across it in the field. So somebody else installed it. So I don't have any firsthand experience with this, but I saw a device called, I think it was called a Zen 16. And basically what it was, was it was a 16 zone multi relay for Z wave. And what they did was they ran like traditional Honeywell uh, contact closures on all the doors and all of the things. So the, I don't know if you've ever seen these, right? It's got like, it's got like you drill like a little hole in the door frame and then it's got a switch that goes inside of the door frame itself. So you can't even see when the door is shut, you can't tell there's a switch on the door at all. It's only if you open the door and look where the hinges are, you see that there's a little white thing sticking out. And when that, when the door shuts, it obviously pushes the little white thing in. So they ran those as the door sensors on all for, for the contact sensors for all the doors. And then they ran all the wire down into the utility room and put one of those Zen 16 contact sensors in, which I and again, so that's where my oh, that's interesting. I saw that. And so now I'm piecing together what that box probably did. And my guess was they were using that to, to do automation for detecting where uh, which doors were open and which ones were closed and then and converting all of that into Z-Wave. Yeah, some of the Z-Wave stuff is meant for permanent installation. Like you can get the contact sensors where you're actually meant to drill a hole into the door and into the frame. Yeah, and they're actually about. meant to like be set in. Yeah, yep, that's what I saw. 
Yeah, except the contact sensors weren't Z-Wave themselves. They were just literally two little pieces. You know, I mean, like you push the button in and it shorts a piece of wire. So uh, the advantage there, right, there's no electronics, there's no power, there's nothing in the door. All of that is accessible in the utility room. But anyway, my thought process with that was something along the lines of if you were concerned about the aesthetics, I wonder if something like that could work. It definitely could for, for some of that, right? Um, it's a bigger discussion, and I'm pretty sure we're boring people now. <laughs> Fair enough. If you have home automation questions, if you have home automation feedback, what are you doing in your house? What do you like? Do you like Z-Wave? Do you like Zigbee? What works? Steve is on his fifth and final controller. After that, he's going to rage quit uh, Zigbee. So if you have something that's working for you, or if you have questions, write in live at asknoahshow.com. We'd love to hear from you. From the Linux Newswire Newsroom, this is the Week in Review with JT. For the week of April 9th, 2023, here's the Linux and open source news. OpenBSD 7.3 has been released and is the 54th release of OpenBSD. OpenWRT 22.03.4 has also been released. And while we're speaking of things open, OpenShot 3.1 has been released with time mapping and a lot of bug fixes. When Linux Mint 21.2 is released this June, it'll come with a selection of new visual styles for Cinnamon users to choose from. The ButterFS scrub code that is used for going through the file system data and metadata to verify checksums and repairing damaged blocks is seeing some improvements in Linux 6.4. Also in Linux 6.4, Qualcomm is working on their Cloud AI driver, which will live under the Direct Rendering Manager umbrella. And after releasing the Shield Thunderstrike gaming controller back in 2017, NVIDIA has now decided to work on upstreaming their HD driver support into Linux. In other hardware news, the System76 CEO Carl Richel has been teasing an in-house Linux laptop codenamed Virgo. Pine64 has launched the Star64, their first RISC-V single board computer. The Star64 will come in two variants, one with 4GB and one with 8GB of RAM. But it's too late to grab the first round, they're already sold out. The German-based Linux hardware vendor and software supplier Tuxedo Computers has announced the availability of a new generation of its Tuxedo Stellaris 16 laptop. The Stellaris 16 5th gen laptop comes with an Intel i9-13900HX with 24 cores, 32 threads, and a clock rate of up to 5.4 GHz, as well as up to 64 GB of DDR5 RAM, 4 TB of NVMe storage, and the big feature is the mobile version of the NVIDIA RTX 4090 with 12 gig of VRAM. But all that power comes at a cost. So Tuxedo made sure the laptop is compatible with their Aquarius external liquid cooling solution for laptops. In legal news, the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit has affirmed a district court ruling that asserted that non-literal elements of a software program were not copyright protectable, in part because they copied materials containing open source elements that were not original. The CISA director, Jen Easterly, has recently said the nation's cyber defense agency was hiring an open source security lead and that CISA is establishing new public-private sector initiatives through the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative as part of an effort to advance security for open source, which she claims is one of the most important ecosystems that we have to power the federal government and critical infrastructure. And speaking of security, hackers have been flooding NPM with bogus packages causing a DOS attack. While similar campaigns were recently observed propagating phishing links, the latest wave pushed the number of packaged versions up to 1.42 million, a sharp increase from the approximate 800,000 packages released on NPM. This week in our feature segment, we're going to talk a little bit about privacy respecting mail. So I've successfully disconnected myself from the antiquated and outdated public phone system. I've successfully disconnected myself from the claws of Google, but the remaining thing in society that I'm still stuck with is physical mail. And so as I'm starting to look at ways that I can drag mail kicking and screaming into 2023, I've started to look at privacy respecting mailboxes and I've come across a number of problems. So the, the first initial thing that I went to is like everybody else, well, I'll just get a PO box. That's what you always hear people do. That's business have been doing it for years. Privacy advocates have been doing things like that for years. And at least your name and information isn't scattered all over the place. And they don't actually know where you're residing just because they sent you something one time. So I investigated the idea of a P.O. box, but a P.O. box offered by the United States Postal Service is physically located at the post office and your address will not 
your address is is not necessarily corresponding to the PO box. So they 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 ship it. They can send mail to it, and they'll give you a PO box number. But the address is the address of the post office box, and the you know the 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 or excuse me, the address of the post office and the PO box is the place where the actual mail comes. The killer factor for me there is they will only accept mail from the United States Postal Service. They won't accept mail from like, let's say you order an Amazon package from UPS. So that takes me to uh, two other services that are available. One is called America's Mailbox. You can learn more at americasmailbox.com. And the second is travelingmailbox.com. So americasmailbox.com, they built it on the concept that uh, their, their company lives and breathes customer service and they want to be mindful of that. They want to be aware of that. And so they would argue that they don't charge high rates that other companies do. They don't have any hidden charges. You just pay what you need as far as their services. It's pretty straightforward. You uh, buy a box from these guys and they're actually located in Steve's neck of the woods in South Dakota. And so you get a South Dakota address and they offer it basically in three plans. The The entry level plan is the bronze plan for $169 a year. The silver plan is $189 a year and the gold plan is $209 a year. With the bronze plan, you can receive up to seven pieces of mail per year, and so it's useful for things like if you're doing your vehicle registration or you want home base for uh, really important documents, and that will get you by. But if you want to use something you know, as a general purpose mailbox, obviously seven pieces of mail isn't going to do much diddly squat, and so then you're looking at either the silver or the gold plan. The silver plan, all mail is forwarded including junk mail and only occasional packaging or special handling is 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 forwarded and they offer that uh, as well as a vacation plan for 15.99 a month so if you're needing to just use it for a, a a special amount of time or a limited amount of time and then their largest plan their gold plan junk mail is removed prior to forwarding via ups or fedex and then they do you, they'll do special handling for your mail and packages and and of course they give you 24 7 365 uh day access to encrypted online access to to your accounts so you can check those out those are okay and i have them i've done the most research on america's mailbox so they're uh they're kind of the ones that i'm 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 most intimately familiar at this point the other one is Traveling Mailbox. So you can learn about Traveling Mailbox at travelingmailbox.com. And they're on a mission to provide high quality virtual mail services with mail scanning, mail for forwarding, and helping travelers and business people affordably manage their posting or their their mail postal online. So this is a it's a little bit more expensive, a lot bit more expensive actually. So it's fifteen dollars a month for their basic plan which includes 35 pages of scan mail a month or 40 incoming envelopes a month. The extended plan will get you 80 page scans a month or 100 incoming envelopes a month. And then their small business plan will get you 200 incoming envelopes a month and 160 pages per month. What I like about traveling mailboxes, they include a web UI and an app that you can install. And then what you're able to do is you can just tell them like, hey, that piece of mail, I want scanned. That piece of mail, you can discard. That piece of mail, I need physically forwarded to me. Don't open it, just send it straight to me. And they'll allow you to do that. They also offer some enterprise plans. So if you're doing like super high volume, they'll charge you a dollar per piece. And then I assume that there is some other stuff that goes along with that, but they have enterprise plans available as well. In either event, if you're one of the people that are saying, I don't really want my personal address out all over Kingdom, come I want but I need the ability to receive mail and to receive packages you might check out either travelingmailbox.com or americasmailbox.com we'll have links for both of those in the show notes you'll find those at podcast.asknoahshow.com in the news this week Pine Tab 2 and the Pine Tab 5 are available for pre-orders. The pre-orders are going to begin on April 13th, so that's two days from now. Both tablets feature a 1200 by 800 resolution 10.1 inch IPS display with viewing angles, a sturdy metal chassis, two USB-C ports, one USB type, uh, one USB 3.0, one USB 2.0 for charging, a digital video out port, a front-facing 2-megapixel camera, a rear-facing 5-megapixel camera, as well as a 6,000 milliamp battery. Both come bundled with magnetically fitted detachable backlit keyboards. 
as well as connecting via pogo pins to a USB 2.0 protocol that doubles as a carrying case. They're available in two hardware configurations, the 4 gigabyte of RAM 64 gig eMMC flash and the 8 gigabyte of RAM 128 gigabyte eMMC storage. And finally, the PineTab 2 and the F PineTab 5 both start at $159. So, if you have any experience with ARM-based devices, the I would describe the Pine devices as budget-friendly price point, medium point of performance. So it's not a tier A device. I don't think you're going to compare it with the latest Samsung Galaxy tablet or the latest Samsung Galaxy phone, the latest I iPad. But what you're going to get is an incredibly easy way to be able to hack and play with your tablet. So the rigmarole that I've gone through with this godforsaken S10 that was lobbied by the, you know, the uh, American cell phone manufacturers and American cell phone providers to say, don't give them access to the device. Those are the kind of games that you're just not going to be able to play with Pine. They designed the device for you to be able to flash stuff onto it. And they have a software. So essentially what you do is you flash the software onto an SD card. You stick the SD card into the Pine uh, device and you turn it on. And it boots up and show, and the eMMC storage device shows up as a removable storage device on your laptop. And then from there, you download whatever operating system you want, and you can DD it straight onto the device. And Bob's your uncle, you have a fully functioning device. My, the appeal to me in these devices is twofold. So first of all, I'm still searching for the ideal companion device. And one of the things that, one of the nuts I still haven't been able to crack, and I'm still trying devices to, to do this, is I'm looking for a device that will simply di display my drum charts for me when I'm when I'm playing drums. And I would like to do that on an open source device. And the problem that I have with the PineTap, if I'm being honest, is the resolution of the display. So all of these charts, the default of for the chart was 1080p because all of the newer Samsung tablets and iPads are going up to 2K resolution and higher. I've resized. I just got done resizing all those charts to take advantage of the higher screen resolution. So I'm a bit disappointed with 1200 by 800 as a screen resolution on a tablet. I would meter that by also saying it's only $159. And so for what you're getting, it's still I still think you're getting more hardware value than you're than you're actually putting out in money. But suffice to say, I'm a little disappointed there. As for the actual difference between the Pine Tab 2 and the Pine Tab 5. So the Pine Tab 2 is the ARM device that you're familiar with. If you've used the Pine Tab 1, it's going to be just a new and improved version of that. If you've used any Android tablet or Android phone, it's going to be largely on par with those devices. The Pine Tab 5 is unique because it's using RISC 5. And you uh, a few episodes ago, a few weeks ago, we had somebody talking about RISC 5 and the and the architecture and why this very popular, very prominent Dominant open ISA is gaining traction and it's continuing to gain traction. And so now you're having developers that are going to want to and they're going to need to get hands on with risk five hardware so that they can develop their apps and make things work for it. And if we ever get to a point where risk five becomes super prominent and super popular and is on a wide variety of devices, Linux is going to be at, at, at the forefront of that. And I saw that firsthand when I was able to walk up to a RISC-V machine and I'd not used it before and they had, I think it was Fedora just running on it and walks up to it and, and said, hey, this is just, this is running Fedora and it just happens to be working and uh, what did you do to get it to work? And the guy says, nothing really. It's just, honestly, we've been, Linux has been so supportive of other architectures for a long time that it's kind of been in the works for a long time that it, really aren't any problems and a lot of the software that you're already using is already available on the risk five platform and so as i started to get into that i thought okay that's that's pretty neat and so i uh, i am excited to see a tablet come out that takes advantage of risk five from that same perspective it's the opportunity to get developers plugged in and hacking on a particular device so that down the road when other manufacturers come out with risk risk five devices we are not going to have we're going to be ahead of the game once again so nobody else right now, and I shouldn't say nobody else, but very few other cell phone manufacturers, tablet manufacturers are working on RISC-V. They're all in on ARM. And so we've kind of got that down to a fine science. So if you're looking at these, they are going to go fast. The last time 
Every time, really, Pine opens up with a sale, with the exception of the Pine time, uh, well, it seems to be readily available enough. But everything else, they open up the sale, it's there for a day or two, and then it's gone, and they're sold out. And then you got to wait for another window. And with the Pine tab, at least the first generation, I never did find a window, and I actually resorted to going on to the forums and eBay to try to get my hands on one, and I was unsuccessful in doing so. So I will likely be purchasing a Pine tab. I'm going to probably get the ARM version because I want it to work out of the box. And what you should be aware of is you've, if you purchase the Pine Tab 5, it's great, it's awesome, it's fantastic that they're branching off into new and uncharted territory, but remember, there's not going to be widespread support for Linux on a tablet running RISC-V because this is kind of a new thing. So if you're a developer or you're interested in playing with something very, very new and very, very bleeding edge, you might consider the Pine Time 5, but if not, and you're just looking for an extensible, hackable, usable, user-friendly tablet in which they're going to give you all of the design specifications. They're not going to stop you from ordering or replacing parts. They're going to sell you the parts to the extent that they can. And it's going to be easier than Pi to be able to install uh, various operating systems and try them out on a tablet form factor. The Pine Tab 2 is absolutely the direction you want to go. 159 bucks and available from Pine64.com, Pine64.org being the organization, Pine64.com being the site. Um, Steve, have you had any interest? I, I know you're not a phone guy. It's just the glass thing that sits on your desk. How about tablets? Do you have any interest in a tablet or is that anything that appeals to you? I tried to get a hold of the Pine tab like you uh, multiple times. I didn't go to eBay. I always find that a little bit sketch for some things and so i didn't go to ebay i've tried multiple times i've i signed up for the like hey notify me when it's available that sort of stuff never been able to get my hands on it i had a i've had an android tablet for a long time although i abandoned it some time ago to my children's uses mm. um, because ultimately i just don't have the need for that form factor currently yeah, I like I say, the only need I have is my drum charts. Past that, I would just honestly, I'd prefer a laptop. Um, and if I'm not on a laptop, then it's because I want a smaller form factor, and so then really I'm out of phone. Um, it, 2-Bit in the chat room says you should probably use PineTab V uh, instead of 5. That could create confusion. PineTab V is a RISC-V CPU and isn't really functional yet. It It needs more devs to make... The driver. So again, you're buying a very, very unfunctional device if you're buying the Pine Tab V. But so you're potentially in the market then for a Pine Tab too. I mean, maybe I'm not. Uh, I'm not particularly sold. Like I said, I don't have any need for the form factor anymore. I've got a Steam Deck, I have mm. a phone, and I've got a laptop, and that that pretty much covers the different sizes. Well, fair enough. I'll tell you what I don't have a need for. I don't have a need for cloud services where the rug gets pulled out from under me. And Google announced that it's shutting down the service for several Nest smart home products. So most of the devices haven't been for sale for years, but all of the hardware is tied to the cloud. So Google turning off the servers makes them into useless paperweights. So the first company is Dropcam and Dropcam Pro. And so Google bought Dropcam and, 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 and sucked it up into their Nest division, and they're gonna be shutting off the servers on April 8th of 2024, so just over a year away. Now, Google says that Dropcam will no longer work after that date, and you'll no longer be able to use it with your Nest app to check the status. The video clips stored online, so Google adds, if you want to keep your video history, you need to download and save them before that April 8th, 2024 date. Google's argument here is that these cameras are eight years old. People, it's time for an upgrade. It's not that big of a deal. People, and they're going to offer all these incentives for you to get different cam, cloud connected cameras. So who really cares, right? The second one is Nest Secure. Nest Secure was a $500 home security system that had a keyboard and window and door sensors and, 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 um, motion detectors and, and all the rest of it. And the whole idea here was you bought a security system for your house and it was tied to the cloud. Well, Google killed off the hardware in 2020, but they kept supporting the existing devices until this same date, April 8th, 2024, where Google is just going to shut all those servers off as well. And then now that your, your home security system isn't going to work either. And I, I'm quite disgusted by Google's attitude on this, if I'm being honest with you. The, the idea that people would spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars on these devices and put them into their homes and they should get eight years out of them and that should be good enough 
is is quite frankly disgusting. First of all, there's nothing physically wrong with the hardware. Second of all, and this is an important one, no other self-hosted solution is held to this standard. We install cameras and we tell customers you should expect 10 to 15 years of use out of them. We had a client that came to us and said, well, if it's going to be 10 to 15 years, maybe I could go with a cheaper thing. Like, could you get me some used cameras that are maybe out of date and but I would still have some time left? And we looked at the access cameras, which are being discontinued. It was either discontinued this year or is is going to be discontinued within the next year. And they're getting support through like 2037. So they continue to publish security updates long into the future. Let's just say for the sake of argument, we skate into 2027 with our magic or 2037 with our magic hats on and we arrive there and all of a sudden it says, hey, you know what? Still, these cameras are functioning and yeah, we're not getting security updates anymore. What can we do? Well, guess what? We take them off the Internet. We put them off on their own little VLAN. We remove the gateway so they can't talk out to the Internet. We take the Synology NVR. We tell the Synology NVR that one of its interfaces talks to its cameras. The other can talk out to the world. And there you go. Now you can continue to use your cameras for another 10 years or until the camera physically dies which is the only time you should ever be forced or required to upgrade your camera. It kills me because for 10 years I installed analog security systems where you put in closed contacts and they just shorted two wires together and we put in cameras that just had, you know, it was a, it was a they called it Siamese cable. You had 12 volt uh, two conductor on one side and you had, you know, RJ58 on the other side and you put a, a BNC connector on it and it was analog video and you would have, you know, if you did 40, 50, 60, 70 cameras sometimes, you'd run them all to one place and you'd have these gigantic uh, DVRs and eventually the DVR would kick out or something would die in it and you'd replace another one or occasionally a camera would go out and you'd replace it. But you had these things in, in use for 10, 15 years and nobody complained and everything was fine. And there was never a time when the camera got outdated because it couldn't get new software or couldn't get back to its home server or whatever. None of that was a problem. Everything we are driving towards a society where technology is becoming cheaper, it's becoming more disposable, and it's not something that you can invest in. It's just a consumable. And I refuse to treat technology the way I treat saw blades. I'm fine buying a saw blade and treating it as a consumable and burning it up and throwing it in the trash and going and buying another one. That's fine. The saw blade cost me $15. I'm not going to start doing that with $100, $200, $300 cameras. I'm not going to start doing that after I've taken the time to run wire throughout my house and get my security system installed only for two years, for a few years later, for Google to come back and say, yeah, you know what? I don't really think we want to support that thing anymore. Go buy the new one. Rip that one out. No, there's nothing wrong with it. It worked just fine. So for all of those reasons, don't use cloud connected services. Here's what happens. And you can be rest assured that every time a company pulls the rug out from under you with whatever the latest name brand thing is that no longer works and is now a paperweight, I'll bring it to your attention that it was a mistake eight years ago. It was a mistake today. And in 2024, you're going to find out how big of a mistake it is because it'll be useful for nothing other than keeping your door open and maybe a paperweight. You can you know, use it on your desk or maybe you could put it in a museum and say, hey, here's something that's a perfectly functional thing, but you can't use it because it doesn't connect to the cloud server anymore. Our second, uh, oh, so a follow-up to the story, Monitor I.O. So this was a device that was designed for monitoring your internet connection. So it was a company that came out with this device called the Monitor I.O. And you plugged it into your internet and it pinged out to their servers and basically gave you kind of a, a red, yellow, green thing. If it was green, you were on the internet. If it was purple, there was a problem with your internet connection. If it was red, you didn't have internet. internet. And so it was an easy way to kind of keep an eye on your network. Well, it turns out home network monitoring really isn't all that it was cracked up to be. The vast majority of people know that they're not on the internet when they pull their phone out and go, hey, I can't get to Twitter, you know? And the people that want more than that are looking at like a Libra NMS sort of thing. They're not really interested in just a little box that you set up and 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 going, you know, red, um, red, purple, green. So this company is going to shut down because they, it's not a sustainable business model and they've decided they're going to bow out. The way that they've done this should serve as an example to every other cloud provider out there of if you want to be kind, respectful, and courteous to your customers, this is what you do. So they took these monitor I.O. boxes and they published the latest firmware. The latest firmware, which they're making available on an SD card, you can use any 4 gig SD card. And what it allows you to do is after they shut off the monitor I.O. server, the little box will still reach out to several IP targets to be able to test the network speed and stability. And if you want to change those targets, they're going to you're going to be able to SSH into the box and on your local network and then you can change the config file or whatever to 
point to other services. So it means these boxes that would otherwise be paperweights and bricks, just like Google is doing, they are taking care of their customers. They went into this business to serve their customers and to help them understand what their network was doing. And so anybody that invested in this company, even though the company is going to go away, they're going to make sure that you have a nice soft landing spot to be able to continue to use the device until it again doesn't physically work anymore, which is where I articulate the line should be when you're investing in technology. Quote, the monitor IO fan community can seemingly do a lot with these devices. Based on the README for NetMonitor, the standalone system, the company is offering a standard Linux operating system should you can choose to keep it on an uninterrupted power supply uninterrupted power supply to avoid file corruption during power outages. Instead, the colorful, useful charts that you see at the monitor IO server uh, were up are now a data file showing the last few test results. Don't be surprised if someone offers a different, perhaps upgraded system of the system as a flashable image at some point. This is beautiful. Hey, we're not going to put a whole lot of work into it. So it's a config file and you SSH in and you want to change it. And if you go to the web UI where we used to have these great little dashboards that were backed by our servers, we're not going to do that anymore. But get the raw data and so you can at least see what it's doing and if you want to hack on it or somebody else wants to do something with it more power to you now imagine now imagine the reaction that people would get if google said hey you know what we're going to do we're not going to support drop cams anymore so we push firmware out to them you can log into it with and it just generates an rtmp address and you can use it to, for whatever thing you want to use a camera for Imagine the difference that we would have. Imagine the less e-waste we would have. Imagine the return on investment you would have from Google products if they did that. But they don't. They pull the plug and they tell you to come by. In fact, one of the things I saw justifying this cockamamie nonsense that Google is doing is they said, well, we're going to give a deal. So for six bucks a month, you can sign up for one of our new cloud uh, camera things and we'll send you the camera. Great. That's exactly what I wanted. You discontinued your last thing and pulled the rug out from under me, so now I want to sign up for another service. Fantastic idea. You know what really drives me crazy about this sort of stuff is that, you know, these are not 240p cameras. They're not even 4, 480p cameras. They're, right. they're high def, 720 or above, which is more than sufficient for, I would say, the vast majority of people that are looking to do something. In fact, a lot of these cameras have such good resolution that they, they run circles around cameras that have been installed 10, 15 years ago to begin with. So far from being any kind of junk, they, the camera doesn't need to have any smarts in it. It just simply needs to be able to, uh, you know, back in the day we had a camcorder, uh -huh. you know, one of those ancient things. And even if you didn't have a tape in the camcorder, you could run a, an RCA cable yes. from your camera to the TV and still just put the stream up on the TV. You know, we were able to do that in the 1980s. Why, why do we need a cloud connected service in order to do this in 2023? Absolutely. I, I mean, and consider this, right? What if you're a parent and you're looking for, you know, nanny cam kind of a thing? I mean, can you, can you, can the camera take the video feed and spit it out into, you know, a local web page or something and somebody could pull it up? I mean, there's all the, the, the hacker community would find all sorts of uses for that kind of stuff, but Google yeah. doesn't care. They don't. Yeah, that's the thing that that is really kind of burns us. Right. Is I know we're we're running low on time, but the idea is you don't even have to make this user friendly. Mm -hmm. It just has to be accessible to someone mm -hmm. and someone will will figure out how to make this better for the real world and do your work for you. Yeah. They, I, so to me, they would have saved a lot of face. But again, they're not interested in pleasing you as a customer. They're interested in earning your subscription dollars. And so they shut this thing down and planned obsolescence and they pull you into the next thing. And now you sign back up and you put in a new subscription and you're on for six bucks a month and they have you hooked for another five years and then they get to do it all over again. So if that's the boat you want to play, go for it. We'll continue to recommend otherwise here on Ask Noah. Hey, I appreciate you joining us. The music in our ears means we're out of time. If you like the show, follow us on Twitter at Ask Noah Show. I'm at Colonel Linux. He's at Linux Ovens. You can catch all the show notes at podcast.asknoahshow. And we'll be back next week, Tuesday, 6 p.m. Central. Mm -hmm.